Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the 31st Project 2000 Recognition Luncheon. My name is Ron Barnes, and I had the pleasure of being a 21-year-old rookie at its Folsom State Prison, and I met a guy named Lieutenant Glenn Mueller at that time. And throughout my career, as I moved up the chain, Glenn moved up the chain, and we worked at several different prisons, and Glenn ended up being my warden uh, when I was a, a correctional lieutenant there at Folsom Prison. So in 2017, I became uh, a member of this board, and now I'm one of the national directors, and I'm the newest national director. I'm really proud to be here with everybody this afternoon. I began contributing to the uh, organization upon its inception when Glenn was there at Folsom Prison. I started in 1983, and I think it was late 83, early 84, when uh, the founding fathers created this foundation. I'm real proud of this organization. I'm proud of what we stand for, and I'm extremely proud of what we do daily. And that's the reason that I got back into this. I'd like to have a song played by Edwin Gonzalez, a retired from the Washington State. He's going to play a song for us. Before a meal served, I just wanted to add one more thing. Don talked about the fun facts the other night and some of the things about Minnesota. And I think it'd be remiss not to talk about, you know, spam was created here in 1937. It's huge. I looked it up. As of 2012, they've sold over 8 billion cans of spam. It's produced right down the road here about 90 miles away. They call it Spam Town USA. So I thought I'd, I'd add that. Um, at this time, I'd like to have our CPO Foundation chaplain, Gary Evans, come up and lead us in prayer. Let us pray. Fathers, we come together, dear Lord, today to honor these assault victims, dear Lord. We just pray that your presence 
would be in this room, dear Lord, that you would place your love upon them, dear Lord. And when you would give us the guidance to show them the brotherly love that we have as brothers and sisters in corrections, dear Lord. Now, dear Lord, we just pray that you be with us and guide us and you bless us food, as always, to the nourishment of our bodies and our bodies to your will. And we pray this all in your Son, Jesus Christ's name and for his sake. Amen. Okay, everybody, you go ahead and please enjoy your lunch, and we'll uh, start the program after lunch. Thank you. At this time, I'd like to start today's program and get started by introducing our first speaker, Mr. Gary Moore, and he spoke on yesterday for us. He's the uh, president of the American Correctional Association, and he's a former director the state of Ohio, and next year we're going to be in Columbus, Ohio, so Gary's going to talk a little bit about that. Thank you. You know, I always told my staff, you never clap before someone speaks because you have no idea what they're going to say, right? Uh, well, it is, uh, one, it's a humbling honor to be here, and I, I've, I've made that clear and as I said yesterday it's a it's a day yesterday when I addressed the memorial service that, that I will never forget uh, we are very happy to bring this great event to Ohio next year and I, I Don and I've worked for years um, and on a number of subjects uh, to to make this right in Ohio and uh, and I know it will be and I, I just want to say that during my eight years as director uh, in Ohio the first Friday in May of every year, which is Correctional Employees Week, we had a memorial service at our memorial park and we recognized 17 names of Ohio correctional staff that throughout our history were killed at the hands of inmates. That was the most significant day of my year every year. And I know that this uh, CPOF is going to be so well received in Ohio because of what the service has meant and what the loss of lives uh, has meant. And, and I, I would just say on a personal note, uh, every night before I went to bed as a director, I prayed that we would not lose a single employee. And I'm here to thank God that that didn't happen. We did not lose anyone during those eight years. So we will be in Ohio. Let me just say this. The Ohio State, you're going to hear about this. So if you hear this, if you hear the spelling of O-H, when you get to Ohio, you're going to hear I-O. You're going to say O-H, and somebody's going to say I-O. So you're going to hear that a lot. Um, now, Ohio State football uh, is not going to participate in the horseshoe this fall, uh, and I think that's a mistake, but uh, that's just me. Uh, but we're not going to be in the horseshoe this year, but by golly, CPOF is going to be in Columbus, Ohio next June. You're going to be in a beautiful setting. Columbus, Ohio has cleaned and beautified the riverbank that runs right through the center of town. And you, this, this event is going to take place right on the riverbank uh, in Columbus, Ohio. You'll be able to look at the, uh, the skyline and look at the, uh, the uh, river running through Columbus. And uh, it's going to be a beautiful setting. And I know that you're going to be so well received. Uh, and I just want to say one last thing. Someone talked yesterday about volunteering. Uh, I can't think of a more significant, more deserving organization to volunteer your time to than this organization. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Gary. Um, listen, we look forward to everyone attending next year. I think it's going to be great. Okay, our next speaker is someone that I consider my friend. And he's the current president 
of Pennsylvania State Correctional Officers Association, uh, Mr. Larry Blackwell. Larry? And Larry has about 26 years working for the uh, Department of Pennsylvania. Thanks, Tom. And when I come to Columbus, Ohio, I'm going to say we are Penn State. <laughs> yeah. All right. So, um, good afternoon. As Ron said, you know, I'm the president of the Pennsylvania State Corrections Officers Association. And um, it, it is an honor to be here. Um, it's so awesome that we're still able to have this project, um, even though the, the world is crazy and there's a lot of stuff going on. And um, I, I just appreciate so much that the CPOF still found it that important to make sure that everybody that's being recognized here uh, yesterday and today has the opportunity to feel this family. Um, again, an awesome experience. and. You know, I commend the CPOF for that. Um, I'm proud to announce in Pennsylvania that we um, now have a payroll deduction slot for CPOF. That was hard fought. Um, <clears throat> so we, we have a way that we can um, get our new members and, you know, the current members that we have um, contributing out of their paycheck. And, you know, it's very easy whenever you go to the academy and, um, you know, you, you, you all get the magazines um, it's easy to talk about CPOF because all of the good things that are happening. And whenever you see that and you can tell people this is a family that takes care of itself, um, takes care of all of us in corrections, it, it's, it's a really awesome opportunity. Um, today, I, I just wanted to talk a little bit about assaults. Um, we, we've had in Pennsylvania, um, the, the assaults have increased at an alarming rate. Um, we all knew the risk of, of being in corrections whenever we took this job but there's many things that we can do to make it safer. Um, in Pennsylvania, we, we have lobbied hard to make the inmates' actions accountable in the courts. Um, we actually had to pass legislation, so instead of a second-degree felony, it's a first-degree felony now when you assault a correctional staff member. And um, now we just have to get the courts on board, the courts and the DAs. Um, and this is a national thing. I mean, it's not something that's... Um, you know, just in Pennsylvania, but um, we need to, to have these inmates, whenever they break the rules and break the law, held accountable. So, um, th you know, that's one of the, the big things that, that we're driving for right now in Pennsylvania. <clears throat> I thank the CPOF for being a great resource, education, and for caring for family members of correction staff when they fall in hardships, when they get assaulted, or when they have their worst day ever and one of their loved ones is killed in the line of duty. The intentional care that the field reps for the CPOF have for our, our brothers and sisters, family members, is uh, second to none. It's incredible. I've experienced it and I'm gonna share a little bit of that in a minute, but um, it's, it's just so awesome to see that they really, really deeply care about people. I've been to several projects and I, and I see what a great way for these men and women that have been assaulted to talk with others that have experienced some of the same things. It makes the United States seem a little bit smaller whenever that happens. Whenever we come together as a family, um, it's, it's more of a community and it, it does. Uh, you know, I'm a wrestler, I love wrestling and, and it's like that community that you know, we, we just experience that as, as a family. Um, and to see how the CPOF takes care of the families and brings tears to your eyes when, whenever you see how the, uh, people are being um, remembered here at Project. All light and death are honored in the way that they should be at Project, and the family members are now part of a new family. So one of the worst days that I ever had as a union leader um, February 2018, Sergeant Mark Bosman was uh, murdered in the line of duty at SCI Somerset. Uh, Mark was honored last year in Kentucky, and his widow uh, came, and, and she was honored. And she, she was in shock at the memorial service put on a project. And it was very great to, to spend that and experience that with her. 
and she just remembers still the, the relationships that she made then. So when Wendy Bauer and, and myself were planning a memorial service in Pennsylvania, we got calls from around the nation and from around the United States and, around, and from Canada. And um, when we told Lynn that we were going to do this in a small little town in Pennsylvania, and we had the, the um, forum to do it at Pitt Johnstown's college, and that all these people were coming in, she didn't understand it. She said, I, I don't get this. Mark was just a prison guard. And I went, ouch. Man, does that hurt. It's like getting punched in the gut. Just a prison guard. So I explained to her what that meant. Like he, Mark wasn't just a prison guard. He was a corrections officer that, you know, this is about our whole family. When, when someone is killed in the line of duty, when someone is assaulted, we all, as a corrections family, feel that nationwide. So when I explained that to her, and then she came to project, she understood it. So thank you for driving that home, that you know, this is uh, you know, a family, and you know, I'm going to um, try to promote the corrections field, corrections profession, until the day I die. I mean, we, we are professionals, and we need to be honored and respected like that. And um, you know, we are here at Project. Um, to all the men and women that have been assaulted, look around you. There are a lot of people here to support you. And there's many others that couldn't make it this year because, like I said, things are just crazy. But there, there's a lot of resources. There's a lot of um, opportunities that you see that you're, you don't have to walk through this alone. So keep in touch. Use the resources that you, uh, have been provided to you. And I pray that the Lord will watch over and protect you and your family. On behalf of the Pennsylvania State Corrections Officers Association, I thank you, CPOF, for honoring these men and women. We thank you for all the ways you form this family together. God bless all of you here today. Thank you. If you've seen this guy's shoulders, you don't want to wrestle this fella. I just, I just found that out. I don't want to wrestle him. Okay. So our next speaker, our next speaker is Glenn Staley. He's the president of the California Correctional Peace Officers Association. Glenn has worked for the California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation for over 25 years. He started his career at the California Men's Colony and became CCPOA president in 2019. Mr. Glenn Staley. Thank you. Well, thank you guys. I want to start off by thanking the foundation and Glenn Mueller for, and the directors for their uh, continued hard work and the passion for our profession and giving me a few minutes to speak to all you guys. The foundation was started in 1984 to assist with family members and officers that made the ultimate sacrifice. The foundation motto is take care of our own. As a member of the foundation for 25 years, I've been, I've seen the outreach extends to assisting over 4,000 officers and their families, $4 million in assistance. They've recognized 15 correctional staff with CDCR and with an amount of 325,000. Unfortunately, I had a call them, made, I made that call for one of my members at my prison. He was brutally attacked. Uh, we hear it's just a minimum security or a level one this correctional officer was doing his job this day, got attacked by nine gang members in a minimum facility. Nine months later, succumbed to his injuries due to the attack. The foundation was there for every step. They asked what we needed, where we needed help, and they filled in the blanks for us. Um, we couldn't ask for a better partnership during this horrific time. 
with the family, and also with our own members. Um, as a state president, it's something you know you might have to address globally in our state, but when it happens at your own prison, it's a punch in the gut. It's always a punch in the gut, but it's when someone you clock in and out every day and you see it. And uh, I just can't thank the foundation for stepping up and helping not just the family, but also the employees that was left behind from this uh, tragic event. We're in a time in our profession as being under attack. Our livelihoods have been questioned. We have politicians pandering to the most aggressive, progressive communities whose views I do not believe reflect those of the general public. This isn't about being a Democrat or a Republican. It's about dealing with an extreme ideology that is defunding police, devaluing our hard work. We cannot let these movements take away from the ultimate sacrifice from our friends and loved ones have given. With the foundation as a solid advocate during these troubled times, CCPOA is committed to partnership up with the foundation and combat this environment. I believe this is going nationwide, it's just not California. At times I feel California is probably the only state that's different, I will say. <laughs> but we really appreciate the foundation and I'm looking forward to continued working with the foundation and, and um, taking it to the next level. Thank you, Glenn. Thanks so much, huh? Uh, thank you, Glenn. Okay, I'd now like to introduce Guy Evans. Edmonds, excuse me. I don't know how I got Evans out of that. Our Colorado CPOF representative to talk about one of our largest and truly one of our most impactful programs, the Catastrophic Assistance Program. He'll also be introducing our assault survivors and our above and beyond Call of Duty recipient. Guy? If I could have Rachel and have Dawn please come to the front. And our speakers, please. Thanks, Ron. Before I start, can I clear something up real quick? because most of you, majority of you, were there last night at the party. And yeah, thank you. <laughs> A little story about my birthday and project. Several years ago, it was started. I don't know what we were doing. Somebody said, happy birthday, guy. And it kind of picked up. Well, that was in June. I don't know if it was June the 6th or June the 28th or whatever it was. It was in June, OK? And it has carried on. Last year when we were in Louisville, I did make the announcement when we were having our Friday night outing that anyone that wanted to wish me a happy birthday during June, that was great, but it was going to cost them a dollar a piece. Okay? But that dollar will be donated back to the kids' room. So everybody that's saying happy birthday to me last night, oh, this is September, by the way, not June. Okay? Thank you, Don. Um, <laughs> And, and my actual birthday is in August, so, but you know, it's all good. We do it for a good cause. At this time, we tried to recognize several recipients for a catastrophic assistance program from the prior year. However, this year's been a little different. With the pandemic situation we find ourselves in, we did not believe it would be prudent to subject anyone who may have received assistance from us for a catastrophic situation to expose to a potentially volatile environment. Thus, we will not be recognizing any one specific individual as an example of how we've been able to assist a person through a difficult time. Let it be known, however, we have been there for those in need, whether it be for a natural disaster, a bereavement situation, or one of those who are suffering from a major medical condition, we were there. It is always humbling to me when a person on the receiving end of a situation says there are others who need it more than they do. I try to reaffirm with them, support them, and tell them there's no one 
who needs it more than they do at that time. Hopefully, after visiting with them for a period of time, they understand that we truly do want to recognize them and be there to support them. Over the last day and a half, we have shown how this organization cares about taking care of our own. We have recognized the fallen heroes, and it's been amazing at the support we have shown to the families. However, it is more than that. I believe we have also established a greater family than can ever be recognized. As we sit at this luncheon, I would ask each of you to take a minute and look around you. Don't just look at the table next to you, but broaden your horizons and look all the way out to the edges of the rooms and look at those individuals who may be there. Please know that this is your new normal. These people care about you and will always have your back. We are your new family and hopefully we're much larger. We do not expect anything in return other than the common component of love. With the backing of each other, we can overcome anything. Please listen closely to the following narratives as we recognize several individuals who are survivors of assault or those who have surpassed the expectations of what is the usual. While our brief description of the events for which we recognize them are traumatic, it is important for each of them to know how valued their commitment is. The Correctional Peace Officers Foundation, all of our supporting members, the Board of Directors, office staff, and our CEO, Char Corby, truly appreciate and know you put your lives on the line each and every day, dealing with the confined individuals as you protect society from them. Continuing with that, every day, hundreds of thousands of correctional personnel risk their lives just by going to work. They are what stand between civilians and those that have been determined to be too dangerous to be a part of society. These brave mothers, fathers, sons, daughters, brothers, and sisters give up their time with their families on holidays. They forego family barbecues, vacations, school plays, graduation ceremonies, well, we all have this year, and time with their loved ones to keep our streets safe. Their countless hours serving their communities and society are rarely recognized. Today we are here to honor staff that have not only given their time and their dedication to their profession, but have been brutally or seriously assaulted or injured while doing their job. First off, and as I mentioned, call your name, please stand, and I believe you'll be escorted to the front, okay? And as I read your narrative, then we can continue with this. First recipient, Correctional Officer Eric Barnett from the New Jersey State Prison, New Jersey. On October 21st, 2019, Correctional Officer Eric Barnett was working his regular shift when an inmate attacked him with a prison-made weapon. Correctional Officer Eric Barnett suffered a large gash on the left side of his face, spanning from his ear to near his lip. Officer Barnett has also suffered a broken wrist in the process of restraining the offender. He was later transported to the local hospital and treated for injuries. Unfortunately, Officer Barnett is unable to attend with us this year due to him being called back to active duty. On accepting on his behalf is Lieutenant Angela Lujan from the Correctional Peace Officers National Honor Guard. Correctional Officer Eric Barnett. Correctional Officer James Newman, Mayo Correctional F Institution, Florida. On June 26, 2019, Correctional Officer James Newman was assigned as Food Service Security Officer. While Officer Newman was exiting the kitchen door leading into the dining hall, he was stabbed in the neck, face, and head by two inmates, both possessing prison-made weapons. Officer Newman sustained multiple cuts to his neck, face and head and was airlifted to the nearest hospital for treatment. Correctional Officer Newman has been been able to return to work. This is Correctional Officer James Newman.
Omaha Detail Officer Thomas Rutherford. On March 21, 2019, a cell door was opened while Detail Officer Thomas Rutherford and another officer were attempting to place an inmate into his assigned cell. The inmate already assigned to that cell, where the door was open, began stabbing Officer Rutherford multiple times with a prison-made knife. The inmate who was being placed into his cell then began kicking Officer Rutherford in the head. Officer Rutherford sustained multiple stab wounds, but thankfully has been able to return to work. Accepting on Officer Rutherford's behalf is the Nebraska Honor Guard, as Officer Rutherford could not be with us this year. Correctional Officer Robert Wood III, Sousa Baranowski Correctional Center, Massachusetts. On November 7, 2019, Correctional Officer Robert Wood was working a housing unit doing a security round passing out mail. When Officer Wood reached up to take down a clothesline which was blocking the doorway of a cell, two inmates assaulted Officer Wood from behind, striking him multiple times in the head and slamming his head into the metal door frame. One of the inmates then wrapped his arms around Officer's wood neck and slammed him into the floor. The two inmates began kicking and stomping him. Staff responded and were able to gain control of the inmates. Officer Wood was sent to the hospital for injuries to his head, face, and ribs. Officer Wood has still not been able to return to work. It's Correctional Officer Robert Wood. Correctional Officer Gunther Friend, Houtsdale State Correctional Institution, Pennsylvania. On June 13, 2019, Correctional Officer Gunther Friend was doing door checks when he suddenly was attacked from behind. An inmate began attacking him, leaving him with two brain bleeds, a skull fracture, and multiple other injuries. Officer Friend suffered a seizure during transport to the hospital and still suffers from memory loss. Officer Friend has been off since the incident and has not been able to return to work. Correctional Officer Gunther Friend. Correctional Officer Ryan Cruz. This one's close to home because he's from the Colorado State Penitentiary. On October 21st, 2019, Correctional Officer Ryan Cruz was getting ready to escort an inmate to the shower. When the cell door was opened, the inmate was able to slip his restraints and attacked Officer Cruz. The inmate used a prison-made weapon to stab Ryan and slice him in the face. First responders were called and the inmates were subdued and Officer Cruz was taken to the outside medical and treated for a six-inch gash on his left cheek. 
The other important thing about Officer Ryan Cruz is that as of October the 1st of this year, he is now Sergeant Ryan Cruz from the Colorado Department of Corrections. Sergeant Lewis Comer and Corrections Officer Patrick Ragor, Green State Correctional Institution, Pennsylvania. On January 2nd, 2020, Main Control received a call from Officer Ragor that he was being assaulted. Responders ran to the tier to witness an inmate stabbing Officer Ragor multiple times in the head area. The inmate tried to run away but was unable to due to the door being secured. Sergeant Comer attempted to subdue the inmate, who then pulled out a weapon containing a lock in the sock and struck Sergeant Comer on top of his head. The inmate was taken down by responders and put into handcuffs, and Officer Rager and Sergeant Comer were both sent out for medical treatment. Sergeant Comer was treated for injuries from being struck in the head, and Officer Rager was treated for more than 30 stab wounds through his head, neck, and torso. Sergeant Lewis Comer, Corrections Officer Patrick Rager. This next award is one that is an honor for me to be able to present because this is the type of individuals that we work with on a day-to-day -day basis. We often hear about two different responses that an individual may have to a situation, and that is the fight or flight. Individuals like this next young man will go over his story, but this is really what we as correctional professionals strive to obtain. Critical Incident Administrator Jeffrey Billups, North Carolina Department of Public Safety, Division of Adult Correction and Juvenile Justice, North Carolina. Critical Incident Administrator Jeffrey Billups is often placed in tough scenarios, working with staff members in terrible situations. However, on his way home from work one day, he was driving down the highway when a vehicle immediately ahead of him blew a tire, swerved, and flipped over on the highway. Billups' training instincts kicked in, and he was first on the scene to help. Two adults and a child got out of the vehicle. However, a baby was strapped in a car seat upside down in the vehicle. Billups crawled through the back window, grabbed his pocket knife, and cut the baby free. He was able to get the baby out and safely and grab his medical kit from his car to help in assisting the other passengers until EMS arrived. Critical Incident Administrator Jeffrey Billups.
Also during this ceremony today, we want to li recognize those that have achieved a lifetime sponsorship. This fund for the correctional helps assist and fund the Correctional Peace Officer Scholarship Fund. This year, we gave out approximately 218 scholarships, totaling over $160,000. We will now present plaques to those individual organizations that have donated funds for their sponsorship, their lifetime sponsorship. The first goes to AFGE, Local 1034, FCC, Pollock. Next is the Carroll Young Medical Facility, accepting on their behalf is Kelly Roden from the Texas Department of Criminal Justice. <laughs> North Carolina Department of Public Safety, Community Corrections District 18, accepting on their behalf is John Lanier. AFGE Local 480, FCI McDowell. From Colorado, the Sterling Correctional Facility. Accepting on their behalf is me. That may have been slower than the rest of them. I don't know. Accepting our next one for the Texas Prison Museum will be Kathy Stokes.
Next will be our award to the Nebraska Correctional Center for Women, which will be received by the Nebraska Honor Guard. One more done. Right there. Thank you, gentlemen. I will say, though, guys, Don did pay up his dollar, so I appreciate that, sir. Also, on Thursday night, oh, here comes Jay. Okay. Wow, okay. Jay does it say it multiple times, okay? Just my last word of thanks to Don Deese, and Judy reminded me of something, that on Thursday night, when we were doing the opening ceremonies and everything, and they played the Lee Greenwood song of God Bless the USA, she was very appreciative of the fact you stood far away from the microphone. I'm not sure if that entails that you don't know how to sing or just exactly what it is, because we've heard you talk, and we know how that goes. Okay. Thank you, Don. Thanks, Guy. Hey, let's give everybody a round of applause one more time for all of our recipients today. Okay. I just want to make a couple announcements for this afternoon. We have the Assault Survivors Meeting, Atrium 6. Everything starts at 2.30 today, 2.30 to 5. And that's on the second floor. A repeat of the gangs in prison, Plaza 5, that's on the lobby level. And a repeat of contraband in prisons, Atrium 4, that's also on the second floor. And I don't know about everyone, but last night looked like everybody was having a pretty good time uh, at the buffet. Tonight we have another buffet, and it's our Fiesta pool party buffet. So we're going to have dinner, music, photo booth, and that starts at 6 o'clock. And it's going to be in the same area that we had our memorial service yesterday. So we hope everybody can attend. And make sure you bring your badges with you at that time. Okay, uh, we're going to make an announcement real quick. Dan Weber, our transportation team, wants to make a quick announcement for those of you that will not be at the breakfast in the morning that you have early flights. Hi, folks. Uh, just wanted to let everybody know tomorrow our vans will start at 9 o'clock in the morning to start shuttling people back and forth, uh, or not back and forth, but to the uh, airport. Um, <clears throat> the um, airport police um, told me that even though um, there's not a lot of people flying right now, because of TSA and with the social distancing, um, if you are not checking a weapon, they're recommending you leave the hotel two hours before your flight. If you are checking weapons, at least two and a half hours before your flight. So um, again, that'll start tomorrow at 9 a.m. For those of you that are flying out prior to, um, that need uh, transportation prior to that, please get with me so that we can get a driver um, scheduled uh, to be able to get you guys to and from the airport. Um, besides our vans, there also is hotel shuttle service that will get you to the airport as well. Um, that starts at 5.30 in the morning. Um, and it goes all day. Uh, but our vans will be here, and we will try to get as many people as we can back to the airport so you guys don't have to use that shuttle service. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Dan. 
Okay, at this time, I would like to offer the podium to anyone who would like to make any presentations to the foundation. Hi, everybody. I wanted to speak for about 30 minutes, but since there's a long line over here, I'm going to keep it short. <laughs> the Honor Guard from Nebraska and all our coworkers had uh, contributed with another lifetime membership, $5,000. So here it is. And <laughs> as well as, um, Right before the CPOF was due in June, we were short money for, we were very few hundreds short for our five, I'm sorry, for our $5,000. But um, luckily, we continued to work as it was every day, and we were able to hustle not only the $5,000, but $200 that we are going to be donating for the children's room. So. We are very happy to be able to donate to our family, and uh, it's good to see y'all. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. not good at public speaking, so bear with me. My name is Kelsey Brandt. Up here I have my siblings, Carly and Kayla Burbridge. Our dad was Deputy Mark Burbridge, end of watch, May 1st, 2017. Sorry. <laughs> um, a little backstory on my dad. Um, he was transporting an inmate back from sentencing on May 1st. Um, they had just gotten back to the jail when the inmate that he was transporting who had just been sentenced to 45 years um, escaped out of his handcuffs and shackles. He attacked our dad. Um, in the midst of the attack, he had gotten the driving officer's gun, and when my dad went for his gun, he shot and killed our dad. So it has been a long three years of struggles and healing but CPOF has been there from the beginning. They've been a strong support system and are definitely our family. That's why we decided to do a t-shirt fundraiser in honor of our dad. Shirts. <laughs> um, We decided to raise money to give back to the foundation that's been taking care of us since the beginning. And now that you guys are our family, we want to be a part in taking care of our own. So our goal was $5,000, and we hit that $5,000. So we are donating $5,000 in honor of our dad um, for the lifetime sponsorship. In addition to that, my employer, PayPal, um, matches their employees' donations up to $2,500 per year. So CPOF will also receive an additional $2,500 from PayPal for a total of $7,500 from us. Good morning, my name is uh, Tom Donaldson, I'm from Oregon, and 
A lot of you guys know that for the last 12 years we've been putting on a golf tournament, and so again in August we put on our golf tournament, and I'm proud to hand a check over for $5,000 to the CPUF. Um, every year I come up here and I invite people to our tournament. A couple of you guys have come out, and I think last night I figured out my mistake. Um, if you don't know how to golf, we too have an open bar. <laughs> so come on out and play some golf. Hello again. So Tom here is kind of the quiet guy who's not going to serenade you. We'll explain this here in a second. So on behalf of the Council of Prison Locals, we'd like to, we're a lifetime sponsor, but we'd also like to do our annual donation in the amount of $2,500. And like I said, Tom's kind of bashful, but this guitar here, he kind of moonlights on the side and he meets kind of interesting people. So this guitar is autographed by Jason Aldean, Keith Urban, Brantley Gilbert, Jake Owen, Brett Eldridge, Marin Morris, Chase Bryant, Neil McCoy, and Kip Moore. So now he said, in lieu of this being in his living room, he thought it would be more befitting to donate it to CPOF to be auctioned off next year. Melissa Contreras from Federal Medical Center in Lexington, Kentucky. And part of AFGE Local 817, we'd like to make a donation to CPOF. My name is Jordan Durant. <laughs> this is my fifth year at the project, and I love it. I'm so grateful for what you have all done for me and my family. I am grandson to Iris Smith, and I would like to make a $1,000 donation to the kids' room. Thank you. Good evening, my name is Jessica Duran and I am the daughter of Officer Iris Smith and of Watch May the 25th, 2015. Uh, this year will be our fifth project coming in here and uh, I am very thankful of all of you guys for all the love and all the support that you guys have given us through the years. You know, we actually feel like we belong and we feel understood and that's very unreplaceable and I am very thankful. I want to give a special thanks to Miss Kim Blakely. She has been always there for us. And, <laughs> and everybody in here has been really great. I want to give a special thanks to Jay too. He has always made Granny smile and Thank you so much, you know, so you guys know she has the biggest crush on him. I don't mean to call him out like that. <laughs> oh, you too, but uh, you know, your wife is there, so I don't want to say too much. <laughs> uh, thank you guys for putting a big smile to my family. It's, it's very precious and it's very important to me. I would like to donate this year on my mother's memory, $2,000. Um, she has taught me to the years to love and care and give to others. And so I would like to donate this money in her memory. Thank you so much.
Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Shantia Brown, and I'm from Memphis, Tennessee, Shelby County Sheriff's Office, Jail Division, where Sheriff Floyd Bonner, Jr. is the sheriff, and Kirk Fields is the chief jailer. And on behalf of Shelby County Sheriff's Office, Jail Division, uh, we would like to donate $500 to the kids' room. That, that's super. Thanks, everybody. <clears throat> okay, I also want to remind everybody, and we're just about concluding our program for today, but I want to remind everyone of tomorrow's farewell buffet breakfast starting at 8.45 here in the ballroom. This concludes our lunch, our program, and I look forward to seeing everybody tonight. Have a good time. Have a blessed day today.